All right, let's go back to the Song of Solomon, please. Song of Solomon. I don't hear a lot of preaching on the Song of Solomon, to be honest with you. But uh, we are continuing our series on the family. And I want you to look at uh, Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 11. Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 11. Now, before I read that, just keep your finger there. Quite often, when I've heard preaching from the Song of Solomon, it's often associated, people are often associated with Christ as the bridegroom and the church or the saints as the, uh, as, as the bride. And they often talk about this book representing Christ and His New Testament church. Now, first of all, I don't believe the bride, and I've covered this before, I don't believe the bride is only the New Testament church. I believe the bride of the Lamb, as it says in the book of uh, Revelation, is heavenly Jerusalem that descends from above onto the earth. And that New Jerusalem is made up of absolutely New Testament saints as well as every other saint that's ever existed. Because it's built upon the, 12, the, the names of the 12 apostles, the foundations are, and the gates are the 12 gates, uh, they're named after the 12 tribes of Israel. So we see a representation of Old Testament and New Testament saints in that bride of the Lamb. It's clearly spelled out that in the book of Revelation. Nevertheless, I'm sure you can take applications and principles from the Song of Solomon and apply that to ourselves as a church and to the Lord God. I'm sure we can do that. Okay, I'm sure about that. Uh, the Bible is a deep book, has many layers, and it can be applied in many uh, different doctrines in many aspects of life. Now, I've seen that preach, and that's fine, but I think quite often we miss the points of this book. All right, the Song of Solomon is actually, as you read it, first and foremost, uh, a love song. Okay, it's a love song between a husband and a wife. Okay, and it's got some of the most intimate, you know, uh, details of the relationship between a husband and a wife. So if I'm covering a series on the family, and I did want to cover marriage in a little bit more detail this, uh, this time, I can't help but preach from the Song of Solomon. Because God has given us this love song, this, uh, you know, primarily focused on husbands and wives. And I've often, like I said, I've often heard it preached about this is the Christ, you know, about Christ in the New Testament church. And so I never really went to this book seeking counsel on my marriage, on family, etc. So I think we're missing this book. A lot of churches are missing uh, the, the great information that we can find in this book. So if we look at chapter 2, verse 11... Uh, I believe one of the key things, you can find it here, in Song of Solomon chapter 2, verse 11, it says, For lo, the winter is past, the rain is over and gone. So think about those words. The winter is past. So, what is the season of this song? If winter is past, anyone can answer that? What's the next season after winter? Spring? Absolutely. It's spring. So the title of the sermon tonight is Springtime Marriage. Springtime Marriage. And I believe this book is written for us that as husbands and wives, we can experience springtime all the time. Okay? Springtime in our marriage. So I've got, uh, let me have a look. I've got a lot of points to cover tonight. 13 points. And I could have done more. All right? But I just want to grab some, some pointers here that will help us have our marriages in the right season, in springtime. Okay, not in winter. We don't want a, a, you know, a marriage that's cold and wet. No, we want a, a, a marriage that's vibrant and growing. Okay, one that's productive, one that's fruitful, one that we can enjoy each other's company. And so we're going to go through these 13 points of how we can have a springtime marriage. Now, maybe some of these things you apply in your life, and that's good. Keep doing it. But there might be other areas that you've not applied in your marriage life, and you definitely need to start applying those things, okay? So, let's start off in chapter 1. Song of Solomon, chapter 1, verse 2. Song of Solomon, chapter 1, verse 2. And, and by the way, these 13 points, they're not in any particular order. It's just kind of the order that I just put them together that made sense to me to preach on. But point number 1, it says here in Song of Solomon, chapter 1, verse 2, the wife speaking here, Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. For thy love is better than wine. Point number one 
in your marriage, if you want it to be a springtime marriage, is show some physical affection to your wife. Show some physical affection to your husband. Right? And I'll never forget my mum, you know, says this. When I, was a, when I was a child, I used to ask my dad, Dad, my dad's here, right? But dad, you know, kiss mum. You know, dad, kiss mum. You know, I, I like seeing my parents, you know, uh, uh, you know, have some physical affection. As a child, it gave me comfort. As a child, it gave me security, knowing that mum and dad love each other. And there's no greater way to show love and I believe, you know, your children should see this. I think your children should see husband and wife embracing. Husband and wife sitting together, holding hands, you know, kissing one another. You know, because they're going to see it in the world. They're going to see, you know, uh, uh, unmarried couples kissing. If they turn on the TV, that's, that's always on show. Hey, they need to see a good godly example of what it means to have physical affection. There's nothing wrong with physical affection. It's good and proper in the marriage. And notice that on the second part of verse 2, it says, For thy love is better than wine. So what's the point of the physical affection? The kissing, the embracing. It's because you're showing love one to another. And the Bible says it's better than wine. Okay, It's better than the best juice you can get. The best you know, grape juice that you can... Re- I, I mean, you know, when, when we purchase those, uh, those uh, freshly squeezed grape juice... How nice was that? How sweet it was. It was delicious, right? And yet, marriage ought to be sweeter than that, better than that, okay? And it comes with the physical affection. Now, these 13 points, guys, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on them. We're going to skip through them pretty quickly. But point number one was you need to show physical affection. And I truly believe your kids need to see a bit of that as well, all right? Point number two, look at verse three, chapter one, verse three. Now, this is for the men. It's here. She says, because of the savor of thy good ointments, thy name is as ointment pour, uh, poured forth. Therefore do the virgins love thee. Now notice, what does the wife say about her husband? That is, uh, got the savor of good ointments. What that means? He smells good, <laughs> right? Now I say this to the husbands, right? Because I think sometimes we can get a little sloppy around the house. You know, it's, it's sort of like, how manly can I be? It's almost like, how smelly can I be? All right? Do I, you know, do I put on that deodorant or, or that, uh, that perfume? No, you know what? I'm just going to be a smelly man. No, look, you see in the Bible here that she appreciates that he doesn't try to stink up the house. All right? She appreciates that he presents himself and tries to be a, be a nice smelling savor to his wife. And she really appreciates that. So point number two and yes, we're going to have a bit of fun on this, is to smell good. All right? Smell good. You know, don't bask in how stinky you can be. All right? Just how filthy you can be. No. Be a husband that wants to present himself well to his wife so his wife can enjoy his company and smell good. Uh, point number three. Let's go to point number three. Uh, let's go to verse number five. Song of Solomon, verse chapter one, verse five. Now, notice these words. <clears throat> Actually, before we read it, before we read it, I'm talking to the husbands here, all right? Husbands, and maybe if you're not a husband, you you probably can, you might know the answer to to this anyway. But isn't it true that ladies are often preoccupied about their appearance? You know, um, how they look? You know, usually if a girl has curly hair, she wants to have straight hair. Or if she's got straight hair, she wants to have wavy hair. Or if she's light-skinned, she wants to have a bit of a tan. Or if she's dark-skinned, she wants to be whiter. Isn't that true? Then they're sort of never satisfied with how they look. And so when it comes to your wife, who do you think is going to be the most critical about her appearance? Now, I hope it's not the husband, okay, but it's, it's, it's going to be the wife. Look at, look at verse number five. Song of Solomon, chapter one, verse five. Look what the wife says. She says, I am black, but comely. O ye daughters of Jerusalem, as the tents of uh, Kedar, as the curtains of Solomon. But look at, look at how she feels about this. In verse 6, Look not upon me because I am black. She goes, don't look at me. I don't like the way I look because I'm black. Right? And why is she black? Is she just dark-skinned? No, it says here, Because the sun have looked upon me. So why is she dark? She's got in a tan. Right? She's, she's dark. And we'll see why there. It says, uh, 
Because the son have looked upon me, my mother's children were angry with me. They made me the keeper of the vineyards, but mine own vineyard have I not kept. So she goes, look, my siblings, my family, they've made me go and work in the family vineyard. And she says, look, they're angry at me. Now, I don't think they're really angry at her, okay? But she's upset that she's been tanned. And, you know, there are some places in the world, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of like India, for example, where they try to make their skin whiter, okay? And so, even like today, though, I think today, most ladies, especially in Australia, want that beach tan, right? They go to the beach for whatever, you know, and try to get that tan because they want to have a, a, a better color about themselves. But there are still some places in the world where they prefer the white skin, all right? And I think this is the culture we're in today. You know, she's upset that she's gotten this tan. She doesn't want anyone to look upon her and says, look, I've been working hard in the vineyards, but my own vineyard or my own appearance, I have not kept. Okay? So you can see there that she's critical of her own appearance. Uh, but look at verse 7. It says here, um, Tell me, O thou whom my soul loveth, where thou feedest, where thou makest thy flock to rest at noon. For why should I be as one that turneth aside by the flocks of thy companions? Now look at this. If This is now the husband speaking. If thou know not, O thou fairest among women. So how does he respond? She says, look, I don't look good. I've got a tan, I'm dark. What does he call her? The fairest among women. Hey, you're the most beautiful woman I've ever laid eyes on. You're the prettiest girl I've ever seen. All right, so point number three is compliment your wife on her appearance. We see this in the book of Solomon, right? Oh, thou fairest among women, verse 8, go thy way forth by the footsteps of the flocks and feed thy kids beside the shepherd's tents. I have compared thee, O oh my love, to a company of horses in Pharaoh's chariots. Okay, and we keep going on, but we see now that he says, look, you're, you're beautiful. And for whatever reason, I don't think I'd compliment my wife by comparing us, her to, a, to Pharaoh's horses or her, Pharaoh's chariots. But I guess Pharaoh's chariots represent uh, the wealth of, of Egypt, the, the power of Egypt or whatever. And he says, look, you remind me of this. Okay, you see that he tries to change her thoughts about herself. He says, look, you're beautiful. Yeah, you might be a little dark, you might be a little tanned, but you're the fairest amongst women. And then he goes on and starts complimenting her. The Song of Solomon style. We're not going to look at all of this. Uh, but it's quite interesting how, how uh, you know, uh, he compliments his wife. We also see in other passages of the, of the Song of Solomon is that the wife also compliments the appearance of her husband. But I won't go into that all that much as well. But I think both things apply. Okay? That we ought as husbands to compliment our wives on their appearance. You know, that they're often critical about themselves. But also, if you read it, you'll see that the wives also compliment their husbands on their appearance, okay? Now, you might say to me, but hold on, you know, Kevin, you know, yes, when I first met my wife, you know, she was the prettiest. Yes, when I first laid my eyes on her, you know, I wanted to marry that woman. But, you know, you know we've been married now 10 years, 20 years. You know, what about the, you know, the, the imperfections that come with age? You know, what about the imperfections that come with bearing children, all, all these things. Well, let's get Solomon's advice here. Go to chapter 4, Song of Solomon chapter 4. Song, we're going to spend all our time in Song of Solomon, in case you're wondering. Let's go to Song of Solomon chapter 4. Song of Solomon chapter 4, verse... Well, what are we going to say? Now, what are we going to say when we see those imperfections? Song of Solomon chapter 4, verse 7. This is what he says. Thou art all fair, my love. There is no spot in thee. All right? Hey, this is the wisest man on the earth. God's given Solomon great wisdom. Do you see him criticizing his wife's appearance? Does he, do you see him criticizing her for her imperfections? No, he says, honey, there's no spot in thee. You're perfect. You're the best that it's ever been. And I think if Solomon can say that about his wife, which was the wisest man, I think that is a wise approach that we as husbands can take with our wives. All right? So something to learn from. Learn from Solomon, there is no spot, there is no imperfection in your wife, okay? She's the fairest amongst women. Go back to chapter 1, Song of Solomon chapter 1. Song of Solomon chapter 1, we'll continue in verse 10. So he was complimenting his wife's appearance, and then we get to Song of Solomon chapter 1 verse 10. It says, 
Thy cheeks are comely or beautiful with rows of jewels, thy neck with chains of gold. We will make thee borders of gold with studs of silver. So point number four, guys. And I don't know if your wives like this or not. Point number four is buy her jewelry. <laughs> Purchase her jewelry. Hey, if you want to give her a nice gift on her birthday, on your wedding anniversary, or just as an ad hoc you know, surprise, hey, jewelry can work. And we see with Solomon, he compliments her and mentions her jewelry, the, the, the gold that's around, or the chains of gold that's around her neck, and somehow she had some jewelry on her cheeks as well. And so I don't believe, and, and look, there are some Christians, actually, no, we are going to turn somewhere else. Keep your finger there. Go to 1 Timothy. Go to 1 Timothy. But if you, if you take the Bible as a whole, you'll see that there's nothing wrong with jewelry. Okay? And there are some Christians that actually think it's sinful to put on jewelry. It's sinful to wear it. And so they won't wear earrings, they won't wear necklaces. Now let me say, look, it's up to you. I'm not saying that it's necessary a command of God to do this or not. It's not sinful, it's just a thing that you can do. There's nothing right, there's nothing right or wrong with wearing jewelry or not wearing jewelry. But if you're familiar with the Old Testament, you'll often find godly men and even God himself describing Israel. You know, dressing up Israel, dressing up Judah. He describes, you know, put, as symbolically as put, putting jewelry and cleaning her up, so on and so forth. So we see that there's nothing wrong with jewelry in of itself. But some people will turn to 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 9. 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 9. And let's read this so we can, we can understand what's going on here. It says, In like manner also, that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broidered hair, or gold, or pearls, or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. So let's, let's understand this. So, if you're familiar with the Amish in America, or people that are like this, you'll often find that the women will take a passage like this and be like, well, it must be sinful then to put on gold or pearls or have costly, uh, um, costly array there, all right? And so they'll dress as plain as they can. They won't put any jewelry on, and they'll just look at, yeah, absolutely as plain as they possibly can because that's how they interpret this passage. Do you think the point of this passage is to not wear jewelry? Is that the point of that passage? Because if it was the point of that passage, you're going to have some major conflicts with the rest of the Bible. Okay? Because there's absolutely not, nothing wrong, and you'll see it uh, as you read through it, nothing wrong with jewelry in of itself. But the point of this passage is talking about behavior in the church. Okay? Character of, of godly men in the passages before, and of godly women. So when we think about a godly woman, so a woman that's in the church, that's striving to serve the Lord, what is it about her that ought to stand out? What is it about her character that people should appreciate? Let's look at it again there in verse number 9. It says, In like manner also that women adorn, what does it mean to adorn? To put on, it's like clothing, to put something on, themselves in modest apparel. So the first point there is to dress modestly, meaning to dress in a way that does not draw attention to yourself, okay? Dress in a way that's appropriate and normal, not showing your nakedness, not showing the shape of your figure, you know, but just being modest so you don't bring unnecessary attention to yourself. But look, how else are you to adorn yourself? With shamefacedness and sobriety. Hey, these are not pieces of clothing. These are characteristics about the woman, Okay, so what is it about the woman that should be a, 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 a attractive or, or what, what should shine out about the woman? Actually, look at verse number 10. It says as well, uh, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Okay, so when we talk about a woman in the church, you ought to be someone whose character has that shamefacedness. You know, you're not a loud, obnoxious woman. You're not a woman, as we read later on, that's, that's trying to be a leader in the church and teach in the church. You're a woman that has good works. 
that has good character, that's submissive to the authority of her husband and, and remains silent in the churches. That's what a woman ought to uh, represent and not be all about them, the broided hair, you know, the braided hair, the, the gold and the pearls. Because I'm sure you can relate to this, but I'm sure you've come across women who dress themselves up really nice, you know, they, they doll themselves up, you know, they have the best hairstyles and, and the most fancy clothes and all the jewelry, but they're absolutely shallow. You know, they might be absolutely rude, they might be obnoxious, you know, yeah, they might look pretty on the outside, but on the inside, they're just a, a woman you would not want to marry, you know. So that is not the kind of woman that you ought to be, okay, wives. But someone that has these characteristics, and it's not all about the bling bling. It's not about all about the gold and all those accessories that come with it. So I wanted to show you that because there's nothing wrong. If we, if we use the Song of Solomon as our example, there's nothing wrong with your wife having jewelry. And if your, if your wife likes jewelry, oh, yeah, absolutely. Buy them something nice. Just buy them something they appreciate. Uh, so that's point number four. You know, buy her jewelry. Give her good gifts. Let's go to point number five. Song of Solomon. Back to Song of Solomon, chapter 1, verse 16. Song of Solomon, chapter 1, verse 16. Song of Solomon, chapter 1, verse 16. Uh, it says here, Behold, thou art fair, my beloved, yea, pleasant. Also our bed is green. Now, what do you think that means? This is between a husband and a wife. Obviously, they're talking about, you know, that they, they appreciate each other. They appreciate the appearance of each other. And then they talk about their marriage bed. It says their bed is green. Now, if we take the theme of this being about a springtime marriage, you know, when it's spring, it's the most green that you're going to get, right? Because the, leaf, the, the trees get their leaves back, they start to become fruitful, they start to grow. I mean, if you've, you've gone from winter to spring, you know how fast your, the grass in your backyard starts to grow. And it, it looks really pretty, right? The vegetation starts to grow at a, at a great rate during springtime. All right, so what we're seeing here is a bed that's fruitful, a marriage bed that's productive. You know, there is actual intimacy between husband and wife. So point number five, guys, is that you need to have a fruitful marriage bed in order for you to have a springtime marriage. And I believe this makes perfect sense because how does God describe children? I'll just read to you Psalm 127 verse 3. And it says, Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord and the fruit of the womb is His reward. So if we have a marriage bed that's green, that's productive, you know, um, then the natural consequence of that are children. Okay, Na natural consequence are children and they're described as the fruit of the womb. So as, you know, springtime, you have the trees, they blossom, the flowers grow, and then in due time, the fruit starts emerging from that tree. It's the same kind of principle. Point number five is you need to have a fruitful marriage bed. It ought to be a, a significant part of your marriage, okay? Let's go to chapter two. Song of Solomon, chapter two, verse three. Song of Solomon, chapter two, verse three. Now, this is interesting. This is the wife speaking about her husband, and she describes him as an apple tree, Okay? Now, you say, why is that? Why is she describing him as an apple tree? Let's have a read of it. Verse 3. As the apple tree among the trees of the wood, so is, me, sorry, so is my beloved among the sons. I sat down under his shadow with great delight, and his fruit was sweet to my taste. So this, this passage might be symbolic of physical intimacy, but if I just take it as it is there, it says, so is my beloved among the sons. I sat down under his shadow with great delight. So when you go and you look for shade, you know, you go to the shadow of the tree, what are you seeking? You're seeking to get under the, the hot sun, right? You're seeking to get out of the hot sun, get a bit of comfort, get, get a bit of rest. Um, and so I believe what this is teaching us here is that, you know, we are, as husbands, we are to provide for our wives, what are we going to provide for them? We need to provide them some shade, provide them some comfort, okay? Provide them comfort. And then it says, and his fruit 
was sweet to my taste. So I guess that represents the daily necessities, right? Eating, drinking, etc. We are to provide them comfort. That's our job as men, as husbands, but also to provide their daily necessities. All right? Now, we won't spend too much time on that because I've covered all of that when I went through specifically about husbands providing for their wives. But let's look at verse number four. Song of Solomon chapter two, verse four. And I, 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 love this, uh, I love this verse here. It says, He brought me to the banqueting house. Now, what is a banqueting house? It's a place where you have banquets, right? And what's a banquet? It's a place where you feast. You enjoy, you know, you have guests come over, you know, you, you, uh, you, know, you enjoy a good meal, you enjoy uh, just the drinking and, and the friendships and, and the carrying on of all of that. But quite often, in a banqueting house, you would also do it in honor of an individual person. You would give some type of respect or honor to one person when you invite people over for a banquet. And you wonder, well, who is this person? Let's keep reading. He brought me to the banqueting house, and his banner over me was love. This is the wife speaking of her husband. He says, look, he took me to the banqueting house. He took me to the public. We were amongst our friends and, and the guests and, and our family, and he honored me. You know, what's a banner? You know, it's a public display. What was that public display? Love. Okay, so what does that mean? That means husbands, he was publicly showing his love for his wife. Okay, so amongst his friends and his families, they all knew this guy loves his wife. I mean, this man wasn't the kind of man that would go to his friends and complain about his wife and, and complain about her cooking and complain about her cleaning. All right, no, that wasn't what he was doing. He wanted to show everybody in the area, brought him over, hey, let's have a feast and we're going to honor my wife. We're going to celebrate my wife and I'm going to do that as a public display. Hey, that's how we ought to be with our wives. That's how we're going to have a springtime marriage. When we talk about our wives, we talk about how much we love them. We talk about how much we appreciate them. And so when everybody around, like everyone that knows us, will look at that and go, wow, you know, he truly loves his wife. All right. Let's look at verse number five. So this, is, this is the wife speaking. Stay me with flagons. Flagons are, is just uh, where you hold drinks. And then it says, comfort me with apples. So remember, he represented the apple tree. For I am sick of love. So it's interesting there, but point number eight there is spend time together. What does she want? She wants him to continually spend time with her. Okay? Point number eight, if you want to have a springtime marriage, is spend time together. Okay? She wants his continual presence. And then she says about the love, for I am sick of love. She's not saying, I am sick of my husband. Why is he always around me? I want, you know, I want to get out of his presence. No, she wants, she wants his presence. What is she saying there? She's saying she's lovesick. You know what it means to be lovesick? You know, if it's, maybe it's a, think about your wives. You know, when you first sort of started dating her or courting her and you're trying to gain her affection and gain her attention and you probably had those knots in your stomach and you're like, oh man, am I doing the right thing here? You know, and, and, you're, and you're kind of concerned about every step you, you, or, or every word you make. That's been lovesick. That's been lovesick, right? That, that very first, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, desire that you have for your wife or, or the wife or the husband, hey, this needs to remain to some extent in your marriage. Okay, you ought to desire one, another comp one another's company. And if you're the kind of person that would rather, you know, be away from that company and be like, you know what, I've had enough of my wife, I've had enough of my husband, I just want to get out of here, then you're definitely not lovesick. Okay, and you're not going to have that springtime marriage. Look at verse number six. His left hand is under my head, and his right hand doth embrace me. So again, we see that physical affection. Okay, this, instead of kissing, now they're just embracing one another, right? He's holding her, um, holding her, and uh, yeah, we, we, so we definitely see that they're spending time together, and the time they're spending together is in physical affection there. All right, now let's look, uh, go back to chapter one, Song of Solomon chapter one. Verse 17. Song of Solomon chapter 1, verse 17. Now remember when I, when I was preaching about husbands, when I was preaching about men, and I talked about how as men, God has put 
has inbuilt certain goals in us, right? There are certain things that all men want to achieve in our lives. And one of those things when you're married is to provide for your family. When you go out and you work, you know, and you earn an income and you can put a roof over your family's head, when they're eating at the dinner table and they're not going hungry, when they have enough clothes to, to keep themselves warm, as a father, as me anyway, I great, I take great satisfaction in that. You know, I rejoice in that when I see my kids and they're full and there's food left over. Actually, these days, the food's not left over. But anyway, you know, uh, but when everyone's happy and fed, I'm like, you know, thank God that I've been able to provide for my family. Okay, it's great affection, a great satisfaction. But look at verse 17. This is the wife speaking. She says, the beams of our house are cedar. That's like the cedar tree. And our rafters or the, or the roof of fir. Our fir is like a, it's an evergreen tree. Okay, so what do you see the wife doing? Is she complaining to her husband about the house? You know, this house is too small for us. You know, why can't you give me something better? You know, no. She's praising her husband for being able to just put a roof over their heads. All right? And so point number nine is appreciate your husband's provision. Because if, it's, if, it, uh, if it gives great satisfaction for a man to know he's provided for his family, you know, one way to destroy that man is to complain about his provisions. Especially when you know he's working hard, he's working every day, you know, uh, making a living, earning a paycheck. Hey, he might not be the richest man on the planet, but he's working hard for the family. He provides for the family, and then you've got the wife complaining about this, you know, how they're living or whatever. You know, that's going to destroy the man's life. It's going to destroy that desire and that satisfaction that a man has. So point number ten, uh, nine was to appreciate your husband's provisions. Okay? Now, let's go to chapter 3. Song of Solomon, chapter 3. Song of Solomon, chapter 3, verse 7. Song of Solomon, chapter 3, verse 7. And as I'm going through these points, I realize I probably have more points about the men than the ladies, but that's okay because, you know, men, you're the, you're the head of your wife anyway. So uh, point number 10 is in Song of Solomon, chapter 3, verse 7. It says, again, the wife speaking here, she says, Behold his bed, which is Solomon's. Three score valiant men are about it of the valiance of Israel. So she says, look, you know, around Solomon's bed, there's 60, free score, there's 60 valiant men, uh, valiant of Israel. Look at verse 8. They all hold swords, being expert in war. Every man have his sword upon his thigh. Why? Because of fear in the night. So point number 10, guys, uh, for the men, is that we're to protect our wives. Okay, now in this this time we've got Solomon and around the bed because of the fear of the night I guess him as being the king of Israel uh, I guess there probably were assassination attempts on them you know there's probably fear that the enemies would come and try to kill Solomon or his wife or kidnap the family or whatever so in order to to accommodate for that he would assure, ensure his wife protect his wife and have these 60 men of war with swords at their sides you know, always ready at all times of the night to protect them if an enemy came. Okay, now obviously, we're not in that situation. But the principle is still true. You know, as husbands, we need to make sure that we protect our wives. That our wives know that they have security, that they have safety. You know, uh, not only the physical safety, okay? Not only are they to know that they are physically safe, you know, uh, but also that she feels safe in your relationship, that she feels secure, safe, protected in your marriage, okay? What do I mean by that? You know, if you spend too much time away from your wife, she's not going to feel the security of having a husband there at her side. You know, men, we go to work eight hours, nine hours, 10, 11, 12 hours, maybe more, you know, of the day. You know, we need to be considerate. Hey, I need to spend time with my wife as well. Because if you spend your time elsewhere, you know what thoughts will creep into your wife mind? Is there another woman? Is there something else going on? You know, why doesn't my husband want to spend time with me? Hey, you need to protect your wife. 
make sure that she knows she's safe in the marriage relationship. Okay, so it's not just the physical protection, but also the emotional and the mental protection that comes uh, with the marriage. Okay, so point number 10 was to protect your wife. Let's look at verse 11. Song of Solomon, chapter 3, verse 11. Song of Solomon, chapter 3, verse 11. Let's look at point 11. It says, Go forth, O ye daughters of Zion, and behold, King Solomon, with the crown wherewith his mother crowned him in the day of his espousals. What's that about? What's the day of his espousals? It's his wedding day, right? The day when you have a spouse is your wedding day. And then it keeps going. And in the day of the gladness of his heart. All right, so what does the wife say? She says, look, you know, uh, Solomon is rejoicing. He loves to put on this crown that his mother gave him, that crowned him on the day of his espousals, on the day that he got married. What do we see with King Solomon? He likes wearing that crown, right? Now, we're a little bit different, but we have a society that's very similar. You know, I've got my wedding ring on right now. You know, in a sense, that's the crown of my espousals, okay? That's the day. This represents a day where I made a commitment to my wife. You know, I took her as my wife. I said, till death do us part, and she's got something very similar. And so I wear this with pride. Well, I shouldn't say pride because that's a sin. I wear this with rejoicing. You know, I'm, I'm pleased to wear this and I love to wear it as a mark that I'm a married man. And, you know, I, I'm off the radar. I'm off the market. You know, I'm not interested in finding another woman and getting married. Okay? And so it's the same thing, guys. If you've got your wedding ring, put it on. Rejoice in the day of your marriage. Now, let me just say this very quickly. I don't like wearing rings. Honestly. When I'm, when, I'm, when I'm about the house, I take this off and I put it on my bedside table. I'm surprised that I've not lost my wedding ring, like, because I, I almost never wear it at home. And whenever I go out, I always, well, not always, that's a lie, but I, I try very hard to put it on, okay? And I, especially when I came to prepare this sermon, I thought, I better put on my wedding ring tonight, you know? But sometimes, because I go to my bedside table, I forget to put it on and I, and I head out. But when I, when I head out and I don't have my wedding ring on, I feel like there's something missing, and I need to put that back on. Why? Because I want to make sure that whoever looks at me sees, oh, this man's a married man, you know, and he wears it, you know, to show everyone else that he's married. And so we see this with King, King Solomon. He puts on the crown of his espousals. But also notice this in the second part of it. It says, or the end part of that verse, it says, and in the day of the gladness of his heart. Hey, you know what? King Solomon looks back on his marriage day, on his wedding and there's gladness in his heart. He's like, yes, you know, I married the woman that I love. What does this mean for us? Every year, we have our wedding anniversary, don't we? Every year, we have a day that we can look back and say, well, you know, 10 years ago, 5 years ago, 20 years ago, whatever it is, this is the day that I got married. And my point is, guys, point number 11 is to rejoice and celebrate your wedding anniversary. Rejoice and celebrate your wedding anniversary. Hey, out of all the days of the year to celebrate, I reckon that's probably number one. I reckon that's better than your birthday, all right? Because you're celebrating that union between husband and wife when God made you one flesh. And if you're not celebrating that day, you're not going to have the springtime marriage. You're not going to be able to look back with joy and celebrate that. I'll give you one example of this. Um, in one of my workplaces, uh, I, I worked with a, a, I was a supervisor, I had another work colleague that was another supervisor, and she comes into work one day, and she's all depressed and downcast, and I'm like, hey, what's, what's up, <laughs> why, why are you upset? She goes, oh, you know, my husband and I, we had, we had a fight this morning, and, I, and it's like, oh, it's, a, it's a, because it's our wedding anniversary and I didn't take the day off, and I'm like, what? Well, and, and, and by the way, she was working like a late shift. So by the time she got home, it'd be too late to do anything on their, you know, on their wedding anniversary. I'm like, I'm like, yeah, if I was your husband, I would also be upset. You know, this is our wedding day. You know, if he took time off work to celebrate it and you're, you decided to come to work, you didn't even think about it, yeah, I'd be a little bit upset as well. You know what I told her? I said, look, I'll stay back. I'll work your hours. You know, don't worry about it. I'll, I'll cover your shift. 
but you go home and you celebrate your wedding anniversary, all right? That was my instruction to her. And of course, she went home. I don't know, I think they went out to eat and they had a bit of fun or whatever. And she came back the next day and she said, look, I'm really thankful that I got to celebrate my wedding anniversary, okay? But uh, unfortunately, she's now divorced. You know, unfortunately, she's, you know, probably committed adultery or whatever. But it's just to show you, okay, that when you start putting away these important days, these important days of celebration, we see here in the Word of God that for Solomon, it was a day of rejoicing. It was a great day of joy to remember his wedding day. Hey, when it comes to our wedding anniversary, men, you know, let's take your wives out, you know. You know, if, try to find a babysitter for your kids so you can head out. If we can't find a babysitter, bring the kids. You know, the kids can, can enjoy anyway, can celebrate as well. Your wives will love it. Your wives will look back and say, hey, my husband is happy that he married me. All right? And you're able to have that springtime uh, marriage. Now go to chapter 5. Song of Solomon, chapter 5. We're almost done here. We're up to point number 12. We've got 13 points, remember? But Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verse 16. Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verse 16. This is the wife talking to other ladies. Okay? So let's say this is your wife talking to other ladies in the church, for example. And this is what she says. Chapter 5, verse 16. His mouth is most sweet. Do you think your wives would say that <laughs> to other ladies in the church? You know, that I, that I, I enjoy his company, that I enjoy... Uh, uh, you know the, the um, you know the affection that he gives me, but then he says, "Look, yea, he is altogether lovely. This is my beloved, and this is my friend." Hey, husbands, is your wife your friend? You know, wives, is your husband your friend? You know, can you turn to the ladies in your in the church, wives, and say, "My husband, that's my best friend." He's a lovely man. You know, do you speak well of your husband? Is there a friendship in your marriage? Or have you lost that friendship? Can you truly turn around and say about your spouse, this is my friend? And notice that it says, O daughters of Jerusalem. Meaning what? She's speaking to other ladies. She's uplifting her husband. He's saying, look, my husband's lovely. He's awesome. And he's my friend. You know, can you say that? Or... Are your friends, you know, when you think of your friends, do you not consider your spouse? You know, do you consider your friends, your work colleagues, or other people that you know, or whatever, etc., etc.? Hey, if you want to have a springtime marriage, then your husband, you know, wives, your husband ought to be your friend. And uh, for husbands, your wife ought to be your friend. And what do friends do? They spend time together, don't they? They talk together. They have fun together. They enjoy each other's company. They share things to one another. You know, they love to hear what each, each other has to say. If you want to develop a friendship, you need to have all these elements. Hey, we should have that in our marriage, and more so, if we're going to count them as our friend. All right, go to chapter 8 now. Song of Solomon, chapter 8, verse 6. Song of Solomon, chapter 8, verse 6. Point number 13, guys. Song of Solomon, chapter 8, verse 6. Point number 13 is be jealous of your spouse. Be jealous. Yes, you heard me right. Be jealous of your spouse. Because in the Bible, jealousy is a good attribute. Okay? Jealousy is the attribute of something that belongs to you. Okay? It belongs to you and you want to protect it. You don't want anyone else to take it from you. All right? It's not envy. And again, I just want to make that difference because today, in today's age, you know, people talk of jealousy as a negative attribute. But what they really mean is, is the word envy, right? If you have something that doesn't belong to me and I want it, that's being envious. You know, that's lusting about for something that does not belong to me. That is wrong. That is sinful. But if God has given something into your hands, it belongs to you and you own it and you want to protect it, Okay and my wife belongs to me, do you think I'd be happy for my wife to just go out and spend time with some old, old guy, you know, some guy from a school that she grew up with? You know, you know, she comes home one day, 
and says, you know, honey, I've just, you know, I'm going to head out tonight. I'm going to meet up with one of my friends that I had back in school. You know, is, you know and, and it's a guy, and we're just going to hang out for coffee for a couple of hours and catch up. Do you think as a husband, I want that? Do you think it'd be right for me to go, yeah, honey, that's cool. Hang out with as many guys as you want, all right? And do you think it the other way around? Do you think, wives, would you want your husband just hanging around with all his, you know, old friends, you know, old, maybe old girlfriends or whatever? No. You know, it should, it should be a, there should be a part of you that says, no, I'm going to be jealous for my husband. I'm going to be jealous for my wife. I'm not going to let anybody have them. All right? And we see this in the Song of Solomon. Look at uh, chapter 8, verse 6. Song of Solomon, chapter 8, verse 6. It says, set me as a seal upon thine heart. What does it mean to put a seal upon your heart? It means it's there forever. Okay? We, we, uh, you're putting a lock there. You're sealing that forever, that love between the two of you as a seal upon thine arm. For love is strong as death. Jealousy is cruel as the grave. The coals thereof, the coals of what? The coals of jealousy. Are coals of fire, which have a most vehement flame. Can you say that about your spouse? That you're jealous for your spouse? Like a vehement flame? <laughs> Alright, verse 7. Many waters cannot quench love. Neither can the floods drown it. If a man would give all the substance of his house for love, it would, be, it would utterly be contemned. So we see that this, this vehement flame of jealousy toward your spouse should not be able to put, be put away with many waters. All right? It's a love that burns bright. It's a love that burns strong. And they belong to you. Now, if you can, if you want, go to chapter 2, Song of Solomon chapter 2. Verse 16, Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 16. The Bible says, My beloved is mine, and I am his. He feedeth among the lilies. So my beloved is mine, and I am his. What does that mean? That means my wife belongs to me. And you know what that means about me? I belong to my wife. Okay? And if you want to protect that marriage, you want to protect that relationship, and, you know, you should not want, you know, like I said, your wife spending time with other men or your husband spending time with other women, you know, alone, because there ought to be jealousy, godly, righteous jealousy in your marriage. That's if you want the springtime marriage. Okay, that's if you want the springtime marriage. So let's wrap it up now. Let's wrap it up. In conclusion, you know, what kind of marriage do you have? You know, can you say to me, yep, I've got a springtime marriage. Yep, it's productive. It, it's green. You know, it, it's growing. The flowers are budding. Can you say that? Or are you more like, is your marriage more like a summertime marriage? You know, where, where there's a constant heat of debates. It's hot. It's a hot environment. You're constantly clashing with one another. You know, there's anger. There's wrath toward one another. Is that your marriage? More of a summertime marriage where it's extremely hot. Or do you have an autumn time marriage? An autumn time marriage. You know, where the leaves are falling off the trees. There's a bit of a downward spiral there. Things are getting worse. You know, there's the, the, the branches are bare. The, the green is gone. The, the color's been faded off. It's fallen off the trees. And there's no growth. There's no productivity. Do you have a, an autumn marriage? You know? Or do you have a winter time marriage? Where it's ice cold. You know? No communication. You know, you don't even look at each other when you head off to work or whatever. You know, um, no communication. It's like you're strangers to one another. It's like you don't even know the man you married. You, you, don't, you, you don't even recognize that person as the one that you, you got married with or the wife that you're married with. You know, it's just ice cold, like winter. Is your, win is your marriage more of a winter time, you know? Or is it a springtime marriage? I hope it's a springtime marriage. I hope you aim to have a springtime marriage. And you might say, well, you know what? No, my marriage is not a springtime marriage. It's cold or it's hot or it's, it's falling apart like an autumn or what have you. You know, what, what do I do then? How do I make it into a springtime marriage? Well, first of all, apply the things that we just went through, those 13 points. And I don't think they're complicated. I think they're a lot of common sense. The Book of Song of Solomon is, is very normal, very natural. You know, I think there's a lot of just basic things that are here that will help your marriage. You know, that's one thing. 
But again, turn to Song of Solomon chapter 2. Go back to chapter 2. Song of Solomon chapter 2 verse 10. Song of Solomon chapter 2 verse 10. <clears throat> Song of Solomon chapter 2 verse 10. Because what we'll see in this book is they did not start off with a springtime marriage. Okay? As we start this song, it did not start with the springtime. All right? Look at verse number 10. Song of Solomon chapter 2 verse 10. My beloved spake and said unto me, Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. Hey, the first thing that you're going to do to fix your marriage is to talk to your beloved and say, look, let's come away. Let's go together. Let's make a change in our marriage. Verse 11, why are they going away? For lo, the winter is past. The rain is over and gone. Do you think they had a springtime marriage to begin with? They were in winter time, <laughs> right? Things were cold. Things were wet, and they just made a decision, hey, we need to get out of this season. We need to get into springtime. Okay, verse 12, the flowers appear on the earth. The time of the singing of birds is come, and the voice of the turtle, that's a turtle dove, is heard in our land. The fig tree put forth her green figs, and the vines with her te the tender grape give a good smell. Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. Hey, let's, let's give this another shot, all right? Let's, let's go away. Let's go and enjoy a springtime marriage. Let's get away from the winter. Let's get away from the cold. Let's get away from the wet. But what it takes to get to the springtime marriage is a conscious, de conscious decision with husband and wife to make a change, okay? To read the Song of Solomon and say, hey, how can we apply this to our marriage? How can we improve our relationship? And you might say, I don't know. I, I don't know if I have enough love anymore. You know, yeah, when we got married, we, we had great love for one another, but I'm just not feeling that anymore. It's just not the same as it used to be. And if you feel that way, that's a sad thing. Okay, it's a sad thing. But here's the truth of it. When you got married, and when you tried to win over your wife, or you tried to win over your husband, you had a great love for that individual. It's there. It's there. You just need to find it once again. And there's something that I learned. There's a principle that I learned um, in two different ways. And, and uh, let, me, let me just, I'll give you one example. In one of my workplaces, um, they created a, a new department. And I was involved in being, being part of that. Um, and uh, because it was a new department, there weren't a lot of, um, there weren't a lot of rules. There weren't a lot of boundaries. There weren't a lot of instructions. And so I took it upon myself to sort of organize the area. You know, I wasn't even, the, the, I wasn't even like a, a team leader. I wasn't a supervisor or anything like that. I just tried to make the place more effective, more efficient, more productive. Um, I, I tried to make the work to, to go a lot smoother. And I spent a good couple of years just working hard in making this department something more organized, more structured, where people wanted to come and actually work there. All right? And so I got it to a point where it was, it was running really smoothly. I actually enjoyed going to work because it was so easy. You know, things were working really well. And, um, and then one of my, my manager wanted to give me a, a new position, okay? And I was excited about the new position. I was really excited to learn something new. But because I spent so much time working on that department, trying to organize things, trying to put things in order, trying to make it run as smooth as possible, even when I left, my heart was over there. And you say, well, how can you love a department? I'll tell you why. Because I put a lot of work into it. I put a lot of effort into it. And I didn't realize it at the time. It's not like I just love it. And I'm just like, oh, woo. It's just the amount of work and the effort, the mental energy that goes into it. You know, I felt like I was leaving my baby when I left it, all right? Because I put so much work into it. And I loved that, that department and, and the people working there, all right? Give you another example of this. When I was a teenager in high school, uh, my best friend, he was going on holidays for two weeks, and he had a, a, a pet bird, just a, a tame parrot. It was like a, a, a peach face parrot, something like this. And I didn't care for the bird all that much, but he asked me if I can look after it while he was gone for two weeks. So they brought the bird over, and of course, being a tame bird, you know, it needs a bit of interaction. 
it needs interaction with the human a little bit. So, you know, you start off by just making sure there's food for the bird every day, making sure the bird has a little bit of water, you know, and uh, when the bird poops, you know, cleaning out the tray and putting new paper there and making, you know, making the, the cage nice and fresh. And because it was tame and it couldn't fly away, you know, I put my finger in, the bird would jump on my hand and I'd pull it out and the bird wanted affection. The bird just wanted to sit there and be with a human because it was tame. It was, it's been tamed since it was a little baby. Anyway, as the days went by, guess what happened to me? Just because I'm trying to look after that bird, I started to love the bird. I started to really appreciate that bird. You know, and then when my friend came back from holidays, I said, I don't want to give you back the bird. <laughs> I've looked after it for these two weeks. I've got a bit of a connection with it now. But I didn't start off by loving the bird. You know, all I did was work hard. You know, make sure it was provided for. Make sure that I was doing the best I could to, you know, when my friend got back, that he'd have that bird back. But as I worked hard on it, I grew an affection to it. My love for that bird grew. My point is this, and I think this is where a lot of marriages get it wrong. It's like, I'll do all these things. Yes, you know, I'll be submissive to my husband. Yes, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll provide for my wife and I'll be there for my wife. You know, but I just got to find that love once again. No, you got it upside down. You do what God has asked from you. You do your roles and your responsibilities. You do these things that we saw in the Song of Solomon and that love will come back. That love will grow because you're spending time. You're making efforts. You're using mental energy and you're physical and you're trying, you know, you're buying her gifts and you're showing affection and love. And, and I'm telling you now, your love will grow. If you think that love has, has, is almost gone, it can come back. It can come back even better than on your marriage day. Even better when you first laid your eyes on him or her. Okay? And I'll tell you, with all honesty, all honesty, I love my wife more than I've ever loved her. All right? I have, except I can't remember how far we're married now. Is it 14 years? 14 years, okay. 14 years married. All right? 10 kids. And I love her more than ever. Okay, I see how much she works to provide, to look after me, to look for the house, uh, you know, to make sure we're fed and all those kinds of things. And my appreciation and love has grown. And I'm really happy about that. I'm really happy about that. I can honestly say I love her more than I loved her when I married her. Okay? And it's simply because, you know, we're doing the best we can in following the roles and responsibilities that God has laid out in the scriptures. And God's way is always the best way. Okay, you don't need to go to the psychiatrist and the and the marriage counselor and the, you don't you don't need that. You just need to open the word of God. And I think if you want to have the springtime marriage, I would recommend husbands and wives just sit down, open up the Song of Solomon, and go, hey, let's just read this. There's how many chapters are there? I think it's eight chapters. Let me have a quick look. Eight chapters. You can read one chapter each. Read it to one another and see what you can gain from there. This is the word of God. You know, God wants you to have that sweet springtime marriage. He wants you to get out of that winter, out of that autumn, out of that summer, and apply these things to your marriage. And again, guys, this church will only be as strong as the families and as the marriages that are here. All right, let's pray.